Hello and welcome to our third lecture on attention in uh, module three here in our summer cognition online series. Uh, today we're going to be talking uh, about sustained attention. Uh, primarily we're talking about what's called the vigilance task. Uh, and then we will uh, spend the bulk of this particular lecture talking about what's called signal detection analysis and signal detection theory. Uh, this is an important part of uh, the research methods done in cognition. Um, I talk about it here because it's particularly relevant to understanding uh, applications of the research in uh, sustained attention and visual attention, in particular things like visual search. So we'll spend some time talking about that and then we'll finish up with some applications of uh, research and sustained attention. And we're going to revisit some of this when we get to visual attention and the applications there, particularly with reference to um, airport baggage screeners. And so we'll talk more about that in the next lecture. For now, let's start by talking about uh, sustained attention. And sustained attention is exactly what it sounds like, our ability to sustain our attention to a task over time. In particular, in the lab, we use what's called a vigilance task. Um, and in a vigilance task, what we'll be talking about is uh, paying attention to a particular area in which a stimulus might occur. So that's what we mean by a vigilance task. It refers to our ability to attend to a specific thing over a long period of time. Typically the way this is done uh, is relatively simply. Um, in the research that I've been involved with, uh, a series of four letters will appear in one of the corners of the screen, and the participant is to push a key, I think it's, it was the space bar, whenever a lowercase letter appeared. And that would only occur about one out of every 10 times or one out of every 20 times. So relatively rare. And so it's pretty boring uh, to sit there and go through because after a while you just your attention starts to drift. And that's why it's called the vigilance task. Because basically we're testing your ability to sustain your attention over long periods of time. Um, there are lots of important applications to this, um, things like driving, paying attention to driving over long periods of time, how long can you do that. Um, there are uh, industrial applications in, for example, the railroad industry. They have actually added vigilance monitors uh, to make sure that their train engineers are awake and paying attention so that they have to actually um, engage with the equipment uh, frequently in order to keep the train um, operating. So this is an important area of research. Um, that we'll be talking about under a variety of uh, areas. So when we talk about vigilance or sustained attention, sometimes we're talking about sustaining your attention to a visual task or an auditory task, um, and so that can become important. And we've all had to do these things. Listen to a lecture, um, you're listening to this right now, so you have to sustain your attention to it, or if you're on the phone talking to somebody, or in one of those you know, phone conferences uh, that go on forever, you're supposed to be paying attention to. All of these are kinds of vigilance tasks. So one of the important ways we actually look at this kind of, uh, the data from this kind of tax is using what's called signal detection theory or signal detection analysis. And it concerns our ability to detect the presence of a signal against noise is the easiest way to think about that. In fact, the math behind this was developed uh, primarily thinking about um, sonar in submarines. So. Uh, if you are trying to detect uh, the presence of an enemy submarine listening to sonar, there's lots of noise in the ocean, and so you're trying to detect that signal amongst noise. For us, we're talking about um, a signal can be a sound. So for example, those of you, um, you've all had your hearing tested at some point. You remember probably sitting in the library with some headphones on when you were in grade school, listening to tones and indicating when you could hear a tone. Um, the, that sound was the signal, and you indicated whether or not you heard it. Uh, in perception research, um, we use signal detection theory or signal detection, signal, signal detection analysis um, for things like detecting a light, a colored light, um, that sort of thing. It can also be detecting a letter in a group of distractor letters. We'll talk about that when we get to visual search. Um, in more applied contexts, it can be a tumor in an x-ray. So the tumor is the signal, whereas the surrounding tissue is the noise. Um, and then we also use this to examine memory research. So uh, we'll talk about recognition memory tasks. And essentially there, we're talking about the signal being the, um, your memory for an item and the noise being um, just your general memory. And so we can oftentimes uh, misremember something as having been presented 
just because it seemed familiar and so there's some noise in the background there too. So let's first talk about um, the sort of four possible outcomes in this kind of uh, study. So we'll stick with um, talking about sort of uh, basic perception. Um, so we have the observer's response. That is, they heard or saw something, yes or no, and whether or not the signal was present or not. So here the signal's present, yes, there's a tone, yes, there's a light, or the signal's absent, nothing has been presented. Um, when the person says, yes, I heard uh, a sound, when there's a sound present, we call that a hit. When they don't hear the sound, that is, they say, I, no, I don't hear anything, when this, there is actually a sound there, we call that a miss. When they say, yes, I hear a sound, but there's nothing, no sound present, we call that a false alarm. And then when they correctly say that there's no sound present, uh, when there was no sound present, we call that a correct rejection. Um, there is lots of ways in which perceptual noise can come up in an experiment. Sometimes it's just background noise, but also um, our brains just sometimes randomly fire off things that make it sound like we heard something or saw a light. We've probably all had this experience where you know, see a sudden flash of light that came out of nowhere. Um, you can close your eyes and see that sort of thing. Um, all of this is different kinds of noise. Um, and so what signal detection analysis allows us to do is to determine a couple of things. One is how good are you at uh, detecting that signal? That is, how sensitive are you? Are you good at hearing uh, something in a background of noise or not? Uh, also, uh, how much noise do you need or how much sound do you need um, in order for you to say that a sound is present? And we call that your criterion. Anything above that, you'll say yes, a signal is present. Anything below that, you'll say no, a signal is not present. And we're going to take a look at some of this in a minute. So if this sounds a little confusing, um, we'll talk our way through this and, and uh, get through each of these issues. But first, wanted to um, focus on uh, what exactly we're talking about with hits and false alarms and misses and correct rejections. Uh, oftentimes, uh, we're also interested in whether or not somebody's guessing and how much they're guessing. So for example, in a recognition memory task, if somebody says, yes, I saw this word on a previous list and it was there, we would call that a hit. And if they say, yes, I saw this item on a previous list and it wasn't, we call that a false alarm. Well, participants who aren't engaging in the task very much, so they're not paying very much attention, um, so let's say they're just sitting there hitting yes all the time, um, if we just looked at their accuracy for old items, it would look very good because they'd have a high hit rate. But by looking at their false alarm rate, um, we can determine uh, their level of guessing. And the most rudimentary way we do this is simply hits minus false alarms. Because that tells us uh, if somebody's just sitting there hitting you know, the yes button all the time, then their hits minus false alarms will be close to zero. Whereas if they're accurately identifying items that are present and correctly reject or that were present and correctly rejecting those that weren't present, um, we would expect then the hits minus false alarms to be um, very different. So these are important uh, pieces of information that tell us a lot about what's happening in an experiment. So um, there are four possible outcomes in, in that, the hits, uh, false alarms, misses and correct rejections. Um, and signal detection theory can be used to mathematically determine your ability to detect a signal from noise. And so we're going to take a look at um, some figures. Uh, these are really great. They can come from Bennett Schwartz and John Krantz's Sensation and Perception book. I uh, highly recommend it. It's a really terrific textbook. Um, so I want to um, uh, give a shout out to them. Um, and this comes straight out of their uh, textbook. This is a, an example I use in my class all the time when we talk about um, false alarms. So. Um, Imagine you're in the shower and you hear the phone ring, or you don't hear the phone ring. Um, and this happened more, uh, so probably more relevant when some phones actually sounded like phones ringing um, and we couldn't carry them everywhere with us. Um, but the idea is you're trying to hear a phone ringing and you're in the shower. So here um, we talk about your perception, more noise here, less noise here. Um, or more volume even, you can think of it that way. So this is just the distribution of noise. So um, you start turning on the shower, there's low noise, 
um, and then maybe it's blasting and so it's really loud here so there's some sort of distribution of instances of noise in the shower um, now if uh, this is the phone actually ringing and here it could be like very loud right next to the shower here it could be in the next room or two rooms over um, or the volumes turned down so you're barely able to hear it um, so again some sort of distribution of uh, the number of times your phone rings and how uh, much it sounds like the phone is actually ringing and so uh, what we're able to do then is sort of determine these distributions mathematically what we can also determine as well is at what point are you going to get out of the shower to answer the phone and we call that your criterion so whatever is above this criterion uh, you're going to get out of the shower to answer the phone and what you can see is you're going to answer a phone sometimes but you're also going to get out for no reason sometimes for no phone that's ringing so we talked just a minute about hits false alarms misses and correct rejections we can identify these in these figures so again the bottom line here is sort of the stimulus intensity or your ability to hear the phone uh, and this is and they're plotted by sort of just frequency so um, if we put you in the shower a thousand times and call your phone a thousand times um, over time this is what the distributions will look like so more frequently right here around some mean so anything that's below that criterion level that's under the distribution of uh, the noise that is just the noise of the shower anything below that criterion is a correct rejection you're not going to get out of the shower um, to not answer a phone. Um, this is then your hit rate, so this anything above that, uh, that's under this phone ringing distribution, that's your, um, <coughs> excuse me, the number of times you'll get out of the uh, shower to answer a ringing phone. Now down here, these are your false alarms. This is when you're going to get out of the shower um, when the phone's not actually ringing. And so this is again because the sound level is above your criterion or the um, what you hear is a phone ringing that's above your criterion. You get out of the shower to answer a phone that's not ringing and that's a false alarm. And then finally here are uh, the times you're going to miss that telephone call because the phone ringing is below your criterion you're not going to get out of the shower to answer that. Um, so that is a basic introduction to uh, signal detection theory. Now, um, we use a measure called D prime, which is the measure of your ability to determine signal, signal versus noise. And we call this your sensitivity. How sensitive are you? How able are you to discriminate noise from uh, ringing? And in the lab, we manipulate this in a number of ways. We can increase the volume on your phone, um, or we can make the phone more distinct. Um, in general, though, what we would do is keep the phone level the same and then determine individually your ability to hear that phone ring um, and uh, compared to noise. So if you are completely unable to determine the difference between the shower and the phone ringing, um, your distributions here will completely overlap and your sensitivity will be approximately zero. If you have sort of moderate, moderate sensitivity, so the difference between these two distributions, um, so you're still going to get some false alarms and misses. Uh, we would call that uh, a D prime of around one. Now, if you have really great sensitivity, um, you'll have very little overlap between these distributions. Oops, sorry, let me back up. Um, and so you have a high D prime. So here it's approximately around four. Now again, we can manipulate this by making your phone very loud, um, or here we could make the shower very loud, um, and thereby sort of manipulate the the strength of the stimuli. But in an experiment, we're interested in your sensitivity, so we keep the stimuli the same. And so people with a higher D prime are better able to determine the signal from the noise. Now, in memory research, we do something very similar. Um, we ask people to determine whether or not something is a memory or not. And to give you an idea about how uh, sensitivity might work in those instances, um, you can think of an eyewitness uh, to a crime. And if, they've, if the witness is in broad daylight and they had five minutes to look at the person's face, um, they'll be able to tell that person from um, an innocent person relatively well. So they'd have high sensitivity, and again, that might be due to 
um, the circumstances in the crime, but it also might be due to their visual ability. So maybe somebody who's really good at memorizing faces, has great face uh, ability, versus somebody like myself who's not so great at recognizing faces, um, may have more difficulty. And so the, those, they would have less sensitivity in trying to determine the criminal from those who are innocent. And so here we're talking again about the ability to discriminate um, a target, which in this case we're talking about a memory, and the target would be the correct criminal, versus the noise, which might be other faces uh, that you look at. And so um, that would be high sensitivity. It's possible that you might have moderate or low sensitivity because um, these distributions are closer together because it was dark, the person was far away, you couldn't see them very well, and so you're going to have a hard time discriminating why this is a measure of discrimination. Um, in sensitivity is you're going to have difficulty discriminating uh, the uh, criminal from an innocent person. And so here we're talking, uh, and th so that's where we're talking about memory, and of course here we've been talking about getting out of the shower um, to answer the phone. Now, one of the other things that's important about signal detection theory is what we call the observer's bias or criterion. Uh, and that is their willingness to make a false alarm versus a miss. And so our criterion might be adjusted based on the circumstances. So back to our example of the ringing telephone in the um, shower. Uh, a liberal observer is somebody who will make more false alarms but have fewer misses. This is probably somebody who's going to get out of the shower to answer a non-ringing phone who's really expecting an important phone call. And so they're really focused on hearing um, the phone and will trick themselves into thinking the phone's ringing. Whereas somebody who's more conservative, they're not expecting a phone call, they might even be ignoring their phone, um, or they're really in a hurry and so there's nothing that's going to distract them from the shower, um, etc. And so they'll make fewer false alarms but they're also more likely to miss the phone. So back to our distributions. So we talked previously about this idea of a criterion. And again, this is mathematically determined. Um, and for this particular course, that's not important about how that's done. Um, if you're interested in learning about this more, there's a the classic book in this area is by Green and Sweats. Um, and I highly recommend taking a look at that. Um, so here we have a very liberal observer uh, who's going to get out of the, who's expecting an important call. Um, and so they're really vigilant about that phone and so they're not going to miss any real phone calls but they're also going to get out of the shower a lot uh, because the phone actually hasn't been ringing. This is a moderate observer, okay, well that might have been the phone, might not have been the phone, it's going to have to be ringing pretty good for me to get out. This person, really that phone's going to have to be loud and true and ringing loud or the shower is going to have to almost be off before they'll hear it because they're very conservative. They really want a strong signal. So a conservative observer wants a strong signal. A liberal observer is less concerned about the strong signal. And so that's how criterion actually works. This is going to be important in our next lecture because we're going to talk about criterion drift. And what happens is people who are looking for the same thing over a long period of time and never finding it, their um, criterion drifts towards more conservative. And so we'll take a look at how to fix that when we talk about that um, in the next lecture. So sustained attention is particularly important for a variety of um, industries and uh, jobs. So air traffic control operators, military radar operators, plant operators, people that are operating nuclear plants, power plants, um, chemical plants, refineries. They have to sustain their attention to instruments over long periods of time. Uh, airport screeners as well, and we're going to talk in detail about that uh, in our next lecture on visual search. As I was mentioning, studies demonstrate that hit rates over time um, reduce and you get increased misses, and this is due to changes in bias or criterion. And We'll take a look at that and how training and technology um, can assist in, in overcoming this change in bias. In some of my own research, we found that people who were abstaining from uh, smoking, so these were pretty heavy smokers, um, who we asked them to abstain for 24 hours, uh, were more likely to miss a target during a vigilance task. So nicotine withdrawal appears to negatively affect 
your ability to sustain your attention over time? And that's an important applied question as well. In other research, we also found a negative relationship between androgens or male hormones and vigilance performance. And so there's some question uh, about what that means, but it's just an important finding nonetheless. All right, well, that is our introduction to sustained attention and signal detection theory. Next, we're going to talk about visual search and um, different kinds of visual attention and talk about some of the applications there, uh, which hopefully will be very interesting.